Well, good morning, Crossbridge. It is so good to be with you this morning. If you're a guest with us today, I especially want to welcome you, whether you're joining us here in person or you're joining us online. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining us. And my hope for you is the same as it is for every single one of us as we get together. And that simply is no matter where you find yourself in your faith today, I hope and pray that you're able to take one step towards Jesus because that's what we're all about here. Amen. Amen. Um, I, I do just want to pause and tell you how grateful and thankful I am uh, uh, for you and how awesome you are and how great it was last week to celebrate with Southwood together. Wasn't that amazing? Uh, it was just a great, great day to celebrate Jesus together. And then seeing how many of, of the people from Southwood and the people from Crossbridge were connecting. And my favorite part probably was our kids running around like crazy around this gym. And you couldn't tell whose kids were whose because it didn't matter. You know, it was like kids know how to have fun immediately. Like, do you play? Do you play? Oh, good. We play? What church you go to is never a question they're going to ask, right? They just ask, do you play? And I, I was really, really just so, um, I was just overwhelmed when I saw both our churches together as one here celebrating Jesus and, and have just been praying, Lord, would you continue to move in this direction? And so I'm really excited next week. If you are a partner here at Crossbridge, just as a reminder, we'll be uh, voting on this merger together. And if you're not around and you're going to be traveling or you're away and you're not able to be with us in person, you can still vote online and you can jump on our FAQs page to kind of uh, figure out what you need to do there. So um, again, very, very excited about that. And this week, we're going to be closing out a series that we started a couple weeks ago and took a little break in called Discipleship DNA, and where we've been looking at what are the different uh, parts of what a disciple of Jesus has. And as we close it out, you know, uh, it was funny, a couple of weeks ago, I was out with a handful of uh, guys from Crossbridge, and we decided to go out, and we were um, playing disc golf together. And there's, there was someone in our group who was a little bit newer to Crossbridge over the last couple of months, and I, I just kind of turned to them and asked them a simple question and just said, hey, what is it um, about Crossbridge that you like? Like, how are you feeling about the church and, and, and what do you like? And it was just awesome because, you know, without missing a beat, he looked and, and I did ask him if I could share this story, so it's okay. But he, he kind of looked at me and he says, man, I love the people. I, I love that I, I have a place to serve and use like some things that I like doing. And then he looked at me and he says, and no offense, Pastor Jimmy. Now, when someone says that, <laughs> usually they're about to be offensive, <laughs> right? We don't say no offense if we didn't think it was going to be offensive. And I love that the heart was not wanting to offend when he said this. And he said, no offense, Jimmy. He says, I really like that, how you dumbed down the Bible for me because it could be really confusing, and I've not really read it, read it, but you bring it down to my level, and it, and it makes sense for what I'm going through today. Can you tell why this was not offensive at all? This was one of the most encouraging things that I have heard. Um, I, I considered it an amazing compliment, and before I could ever respond and just say thank you, there was another guy in our group who kind of was like, oh, 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 he's not dumbing the Bible down. That's not what he's doing. He's actually being intentionally relevant. That, that's one of those things on the signs, you know, when you're walking in and out of church that you see, that, that's what he's doing. And I just grinned and thought, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, we're, we're getting it. We're understanding it. You see, we don't want to dumb down the Bible. We want to make this applicable to every one of us all the time because we know that we're coming from all different places in life. We do this on purpose. And, and I just paused as we were playing, and I say I paused because I couldn't find my disc. It was buried in weeds, and it was bad. And I thought to myself, you know what is awesome? People at Crossbridge right now are reading they're understanding and they're applying the Bible to their everyday lives. Does it get any better than this? Does it get any better than this, that people want to know what the Bible has to say, that in a culture where we don't read, are desiring to read? I I'm not sure if it gets any better than that, but I will tell you, we make a lot of choices and do it intentionally at Crossbridge to be intentionally relevant. And I don't mean this 
in a way that, that it has us um, chasing different theological trends. It, it, it doesn't mean that we will compromise what the Bible has to say in any way. But as a church, it's really important for us to understand that we believe what the Bible has to say. We believe what Jesus teaches us we should be applying to our lives, that it is relevant and that it's applicable to the things that we're all dealing with on an everyday basis. And I love this because Jesus modeled what it means to be intentionally relevant. He was so good at taking the ancient scriptures that the Jewish uh, people held to, and he made them applicable for the people that were around them. Those who were searching for truth, he helped them understand it. And at the same time, he was taking those ancient scriptures and saying to people who did know and did understand them, well, then how are you living this out? What are you doing about this in your life? And so anytime someone came in contact with the scriptures, they were being changed. It was relevant to where they are. You see, the easiest way to see this in Jesus' life is when you look at how he taught the scriptures. When you look at how he taught the scriptures, as a teacher, as a rabbi, he implemented a ton of different techniques, but most often he taught with parables. And if you aren't familiar with that word parable, it's simply a story that explains something unfamiliar in a familiar way, okay? It uses things that we would understand to explain something we might not understand. It's kind of like like a story with a point. Uh, Many of us, we kind of grew up, whether we know it or not, reading Aesop's fables. How many of you are, are familiar with those? Okay, um, you know, one of the more famous ones that's out there is the question is like, okay, uh, the, the tortoise and the hare. How many of you remember the tortoise and the hare? And there's a little throwback, uh, Warner Brothers, for you. If you don't know who that is, uh, just, it's okay, it's a bunny. Okay, a very famous one. Okay, the tortoise and the hare. What's the point? What was the, 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 the bottom line of the tortoise and the hare? What's the lesson? Someone give it to me. Slow and steady wins the race. Great. We, we all remember this story. We remember that, that it's easier now for us when we just see a picture of the tortoise and the hare or we hear the phrase the tortoise and the hare. We remember the story and then we can get right to the point. Slow and steady wins the race. Sometimes it's easier to remember a point or a lesson when there's a story attached to it. And this is what Jesus did all the time. It's what he did all the time, explaining some of the most complex theological ideas, but in simple stories, because it mattered that everyone understood. I want to look at an example of this really quick, and it's going to be from uh, Matthew's biography of Jesus. So if you have your Bibles with you, I'd love for you to turn there. And we're going to look at chapter 13. And it's it's great because it starts like this in chapter 13. Verse 1 says, later that same day, Jesus left the house and he sat beside the lake. Now, I'm going to pause here for just a second because this word lake here in the Greek, it it actually can be translated sea. And it's better to translate it sea because any time the New Testament references the sea, it's always referencing that there are Gentiles who are present. Okay, because that's who lived around the sea, on the other side of the sea. And so when Jesus is by the lake or the sea, that means that there's a mixed multitude of people listening to Jesus. And you have people, we'll say that from uh, very different beliefs coming together to hear this rabbi teach. And what he's about to do now is teach both Jewish people and Gentiles, and it's an invitation that he has for all people. Verse 2, it says, a large crowd soon gathered around him, so he got into the boat. And then he sat there and he taught the people, uh, or as the people stood on the shore, he told many stories in the form of parables. Okay, a story to explain something familiar, or, or something familiar to explain something unfamiliar. And this is the story he told. He said, listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds, and as he scattered them across his field, some seed fell on the footpath. And the birds came and ate it. And other seed fell on the shallow soil with underlying rock. And the seed sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow. But the plant soon wilted under the hot sun. And since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Other seeds, they fell among the thorns that grew up and choked out the tender plants. Still other seeds fell on fertile soil. And they produced a crop that was 30, 60, even 100 times 
as much as was planted. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Jesus tells a story that's familiar to the people that are around him to explain something that may be unfamiliar. In this setting, remember, there's this large crowd that surrounds him. It's a multitude of different, we'll call them even denominations, coming together. And he's trying to teach so that everyone would understand. So what's the the illustration that he uses? He uses farming. He uses farming. And and, and the reason I think he uses this, this story is because most of the people who were surrounding him at this point would have been farmers. It's it's a language that everyone would have understood. They would have all spoke the same things. Have you ever been around someone that knows a lot or two people who know a lot about something that you know nothing about? And all of a sudden, they start talking about a sport or, uh, you know, a decorating style or a clothing line or a whatever it is. And you are like, I have no idea what words you're using. This is like a new language. You see, we all have different languages that we speak. Farming was a language that they spoke. So he's like, okay, I'm going to use farming language. This is going to work. And most of the farmers can sort out what he's saying here. But what's interesting is that's not the language that was necessarily spoken in church or in temple. You see, when when the Jews went to temple every single Sabbath, they would show up, and they were used to um, someone who would just stand up, open up the scriptures, read straight through, and just continue reading. And then they would unpack those scriptures in a way that demonstrated to everyone else who was in the room how much they knew about those scriptures. And they did this, and it really served two purposes. Number one, it would flex their knowledge. They wanted people to know that they knew. And the second was they were always looking to gain disciples and followers. So if you could teach at a level that left people going, ooh, I, uh, wow, that was so deep, you might gain disciples. And if you gain disciples, it would build your posse, if you will, and they, you would have a much better crowd that would follow you. So you would flex your knowledge and gain followers, and it was brilliant. So uh, many years ago, I was working at a church, and um, I, I was serving as the youth pastor at the time, and I remember uh, showing up to a Sunday morning sermon, uh, a Sunday morning service, and our lead pastor was unpacking a passage that, uh, I'll be honest with you, as pastors, sometimes we avoid some passages because you're like, this is just a hot mess to step in right now. This is hard. But he was diving into it, and I thought, oh, man, he's doing this. This is going to be unbelievable. He's going after what most people would avoid. And so he stands up, he opens up his scripture, and he dove right in. And for 45 minutes, I sat there, and I was like, wow, wow. Number one, I I had a college, I have a college degree in Bible and pastoral ministry, and this guy was using words that I had never even heard of, and I thought, how smart is my pastor? And then I, I sat and I thought, wow, if I have a degree and have studied this and dedicated my life to it and I don't understand it, what the heck is the rest of our church thinking right now? Are they completely tuned out? Do they understand something I don't understand? You got to understand, at that point, am I paying attention to what's being taught anymore? Not really. I was disengaged because I didn't understand how I didn't understand, and I wondered how the people around me didn't understand. And, and oh my gosh, the next staff meeting, we get together, and he kind of opens up and says, all right, let's debrief Sunday a little bit. We start debriefing it, and he says, well, what did you guys think of the message? And I said what I was thinking, because that's what Pastor Jimmy does, <laughs> you know? I, I, I kind of said, hey, um, listen, I, 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 number one was, wow, you really know this stuff, but number two, were you worried that you, like, overshot people, that you just kind of went right over their heads? And, and he said, and I'll never forget it, he said, that's exactly what I was trying to do. You know, we've got some people in this church who think they know it all, and I needed to show them that they didn't. And I really hope that some of this went over their head. And I'll be honest, I was stunned. I was stunned because I knew that he loved the people of this church. I would never question his heart for them. 
But I could not understand how that love would then work itself out in I need to confuse you so that you know that I know and that you don't. I, I had trouble reconciling that picture, but this was the approach that a lot of the rabbis and a lot of the teachers of the law took in the temple is they would try to overshoot the people who showed up to impress each other and to gain more followers. So teaching almost always stayed on this super high intellectual level. It, it got very philosophical at times. And when Jesus shows up on the scene, he switches things up completely. And instead of hitting deep truths in a way that would exclude people, he starts to tell stories about a farmer and a field and seeds. This was an abnormal way of teaching. It's not what they did. If you want to tell stories, do you know what you do? You go, go, go be a kid's teacher because kids like stories. I even love that, that when Jesus tells this story, the disciples are confused by it. Even his disciples, these ones who want to follow this amazing rabbi, look at him and they're like, um, why are you teaching like this? Like, I, we're following you. This should be different. Pick it up in verse 10 with me. This is what they ask him. His disciples came and they asked him, why do you use parables? When you talk to the people, he replied, you are permitted to understand the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but others are not. To those who listen to my teaching, more understanding will be given, and they will have an abundance of knowledge. But for those who are not willing to listen, even what little understanding they have will be taken away from them. This is why I use these parables. For they look, but they don't really see. They hear, but they don't really understand. And what Jesus is doing here is he's referencing a, an Old Testament prophet named Isaiah uh, here saying this is how people will interact with scriptures. They think they know it, but they really don't. And then he continues to say, I tell you the truth, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see, but they didn't see it. And they long to hear what you hear, but they didn't hear it. But blessed are your eyes because they see, and your ears because they hear. For the hearts of these people are hardened, and their ears cannot hear, and, they're, and they have closed their eyes so their eyes can't see, and their ears can't hear, and their hearts can't understand, and they can't turn to me, and, I can't, and let me heal them. This fulfills the prophecy that Isaiah says. When you hear what I say, you will not understand. And when you see what I do, you will not comprehend. Now listen to the explanation of the parable about the farmer planting seeds. And from there, he goes on to explain it. And I'm not going to go on to explain it because that's a different message for us. But what I love about this passage is that I think the crowd that Jesus is talking to has been maybe frustrated when messages keep going over your head. They get frustrated at being flexed on all the time. I don't doubt their desire to want to live out their Jewish faith, to practice the different laws that, that they know they have to follow, that they want to celebrate the different holidays that they have. I'm sure that they knew the rules. I'm sure that they memorized the things that they had to, all the, everything that was part of it. But when it came to going to temple, I, I think they went because they had to. Not because they always got something out of it. The teachers and the teaching, it's easy to feel inaccessible. And because of the condition of the people's hearts, I think it was necessary for Jesus to use parables, necessary for him to switch things up and to tell stories because as a culture, I think their hearts, their ears, their eyes had become easily dulled, hardened, blind, when you don't expect to get anything, do you think you're going to receive anything? No. So Jesus implements this amazing technique, this tool to awaken the hearts of people who are disengaged. And I think he was exciting, and curiosity starts to peak, like, hey, did you hear about that teacher, that rabbi guy who's running around? Yeah, he tells stories, like, like to kids but he's telling them to adults. And then he says things like, you know, hey, if you can understand this like a kid, you're, you're closer to heaven than anybody. It's like, let's go back to story time. Let's see what he has to say. He speaks our language. He's taking some of the most complex things, but he's, he's explaining it in a way that I think I get. 
Do you think this frustrated the teachers of the time? I'm sure it did. You're not allowed to teach that way. That's not how you're supposed to gain followers. You do what we do to gain followers. But Jesus wasn't looking to teach at a level to confuse people. He wasn't looking to build his armada with as many as he could. He was seeking to help people engage with and understand the scriptures so that their lives could be changed. There's no point in having someone follow you if they don't have a changed life. That's not what he was out to do. And I think that this approach excited people. It heightened their interest. And then you know what happens when you see that? We start to ask better questions. We start to search things out on our own. And I bet it sparked some amazing conversations between these people who came to hear Jesus preach. Right? I wonder if they were sitting there over the campfire talking about this little farming parable later that night. When they began to talk about it, I wonder if they used the language of seeds. Like when he was saying this, do you know those seeds? Do you remember that like stuff? Like, have you ever had those seeds fall on the path? Isn't that frustrating when it happens? Don't you want to get mad at your, your, your help when they do that? Yeah, I do. Oh, how do we not do that? Jesus gave them a language that was their own to understand. And he could tell these stories to explain complex things because he understood the truths behind them. You know, when I, when I was in college um, studying for that Bible degree that felt like it was no good on that Sunday morning, uh, I was forced to take a philosophy class. And uh, I, I didn't really understand what I was stepping into. Any super philosophy people here you love, like, asking questions that can't be answered? Um, all right, Del, we're going to have coffee. This is great. I love those questions. They drive my friends nuts, but I love them. I, I had no idea what I was stepping into to begin with. I really didn't. Um, I, and I can remember my professor. He told us to call him Jim, uh, which I liked. And he said, you know, he starts to explain some idea. And I'm like, I have no idea what you're doing here. And he starts to reference this philosopher. Um, his name was George Berkeley. Anybody heard, heard of George Berkeley before? Okay, this is what George Berkeley looks like. He's so handsome, isn't he? The faces of the people around me had just as little idea of who George Berkeley was. I later found out that this was Jim's doctorate. Like, that's why he was so excited about this guy. And so, you know, he got excited, and here's what Berkeley believed and what he really summed up. You ready? I'm going to just lean into this for a second. I'm going to read it so I don't mess it up. He believed that only the mind's perception and the spirit that perceives are what exist in reality. What people perceive every day is only the idea of an object's existence, but the objects themselves are not perceived. He went on for like 10 minutes on this, and we look just as confused as you do. Like, I see what I don't see. I can't see the things I see and perceive aren't really that. What? What are you talking about? And he went on and on, and he's just so excited about it, we didn't doubt his passion. But we had no idea what he was saying. And then after, he looks at us and he's like, isn't this exciting? And everyone's like, yeah. I, I, I don't have a poker face all the time. And while everyone's like, yeah, I was like, ah. I, uh, what, what are you talking? He's like, does this make sense? And I was like, no. And he, he says, Jimmy, this doesn't make sense to you. And I have no problem admitting that I don't understand things because there's a lot of things I don't get. And I, I, said, I said, Jim, I, I don't get it. I really want to, but I, I don't understand. And he says, okay. And so he goes on to explain it again in a very different way. And when he explains it again in a different way, it's another five or ten minutes. And he says, okay, are you with me? And the rest of the class is like, yeah. And I'm like, eh, I still don't understand, Jim. I'm sorry. And he says, no, that's okay. And he goes on to explain it about five different ways to try to help me understand. And by the fifth time, I started to catch a glimpse of what he was trying to say. I started to get the framework and put it together, and I got so excited, and I was like, okay, okay, so if I'm hearing you right, what you're saying is kind of like this, and said it in a really horrible, horrific way. I don't even remember what I said, because I don't even understand it now. But I started to get it, and he looked and he said, that's it, that's it. You're starting to get there. And I was like, okay. And after class, I went up to him. And I said, Jim, listen, I am so sorry. 
that I made you waste your whole class period. I'm so sorry that, uh, that you probably had a ton of other things planned for today, and I hijacked it because I just am an idiot and don't get things sometimes. And he stopped me right there, and he said, Jimmy, let me tell you something. And I will never forget what he said to me. Um, he said, don't apologize, because if someone can't explain something in a way that you can understand, they really don't know what they're talking about. Always ask more questions if you don't understand. And I will never forget, if someone can't explain something to you in a way that you can understand it, they, they probably don't know what they're really talking about. I had no idea in a philosophy class I'd receive one of the most deep biblical truths about who Jesus is and his way of teaching. I walked out of that class understanding Jesus in a different way. I know it was philosophy, but it felt like it had everything to do with life, that we have to make this you know, applicable. But how can we teach things if we don't understand them? And, and Jesus was walking around with people who didn't understand anything. And I think like most of us, we don't have the courage to raise our hands and say, but I don't get it but I don't understand. And Jesus is like, you don't have to ask that right now. I'm just going to tell you stories to help you understand, to start this process. And then his disciples do. I don't understand what you tell me. I think the average person back then and today, we are sick and tired of feeling dumb when it comes to the Bible a lot of times. That, that we're scared to approach it because it feels so overwhelming but Jesus changes all of this by presenting the truths of Scripture in the very same relevant way that I think he calls us to do. He says, this is what I want from you. And I believe that because his disciples, if you read how they share the gospel, they're always sharing stories. Sometimes it's their own life stories. Sometimes it's illustrations about what they see around the world. But they're always sharing stories to help people understand it was relevant, intentionally relevant, not to overshoot people. It was part of their DNA as disciples. This is what we aim for at Crossbridge and as disciples of Jesus. We want to look like him in the way that we approach everything that we do. And, and this doesn't mean that we should ever compromise the message or the content of Scripture. It, it doesn't mean that we always have to keep up. And as your pastor, I should look like the coolest trends sitting up here on stage. I, I, you don't want that. I don't want that. No one wants to see that. But we live in a world right now that is starving and dying for the truth. They are asking really big questions right now that don't have easy answers. They're looking for answers, though, and the problem is they're searching out for people to have meaningful conversations with, and Christians are nowhere to be found. Disciples of Jesus are scared to engage with hard topics because I don't think we understand some of the answers to these things. And so we fear engaging in conversations with people who might have those same questions. Do you know we're asking the same questions? And at Crossbridge, we're okay with hard questions. We ask them all the time. Do you know why? Because Jesus was okay with it. This is why we preach and we teach on topics and, and, and we go deep into topics, but we also go really deep into full passages of Scripture. We look at full books of Scripture together. We cannot hide from the world. We can't. And as disciples of Jesus, we cannot just hide behind the Bible and say, this will protect me from everything. I don't have to pay attention to anything. I don't have to pay attention. No way. God calls us to be part of learning what's going on in this world and speaking truth to the questions that people have. They ask Jesus all the time about relationships, about heaven, about end times, about parenting, about work, about sexuality, about drinking, about traditions, about, you know, a host of other things that really mattered. And can I tell you that the people around you and I today, including you and I, are asking questions about the same exact things. And we're so scared to talk about the Bible because we think it's so outdated. It just doesn't apply to our culture today. It applies more to our culture and our lives today than any other book that you could read. Nothing has standed the test of time like Scripture has, but it's our job to spend time in it with Jesus, to learn what it has to say, and not to confuse the garbage out of the people around us 
with the deep things that we know to flex how great we know Scripture. But that's why we have to take this and say, but it does matter. That's why when October comes, we'll do that series, How Would Jesus Vote? And every time I say it, I see people go, ooh, I can't believe you do that. Do you know why we do that? Because Jesus talked about politics. But he talked about being a citizen of heaven more than he talked about any policy. We need that reminder more today than ever, don't we? This is relevant. We have to be relevant. And if people have questions and they don't want to come to us, they're going to receive the wisdom of this world that leads to destruction and pain in their own lives. And we know that because we've all done it too. My hope is that we can do all that we can as a church and as disciples of Jesus to present the truth of the gospel where people all around us who are searching, including ourselves, would say, man, I so appreciate it, Crossbridge, that no matter who's teaching, I love the way they dumb down the Bible so I can understand it. And if that's the language that's used, praise God that it means they're understanding and we're understanding what it has to say. We never water it down, but boy, does it have to be applicable, doesn't it? If we don't walk out of here saying, I wonder what this means for me today, then I don't know that we're necessarily looking like Jesus because those farmers, I bet, went around and talked about the seeds on a farm. I bet you they talked about the sparrows and how things grow, and the fruiting, and and crop sizes. They knew the language, and so that's what Jesus used. So how, when you talk about Scripture, when you talk about the story of Jesus, do you talk about it? Do people come to you with the heavy questions? Or are they scared to, because they're worried they might get hit with the Bible instead of being able to walk through it? I dream of being a church where people want to ask us the tough stuff. And we're allowed to say, you know what, I don't, I don't really know. I, 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 that's a great question. I'm not sure. Let's look at the Bible together. And in today's day and age, we have more resources at our disposal to help understand Scripture. But we can do this. We, as followers of Jesus, can lead people to the truth. But we have to understand it. Can we do that together? That's why we soap. That's why we try to make it as relevant as we can for our kids and the soap guide there. And, and why when we use illustrations on stage, we're always talking about being in the lunch table or being in the, the, the school bus or being where our teenagers are because they're here. That's why we're talking about as, as adults, we're thinking through this. I will tell you, I've had to rethink some of my messages, thinking if we are able to merge with Southwood, how do some of these illustrations just go out the window because they're not going to be understood. I have to think a bit different if we want to be relevant cross and intergenerationally. Lord, challenge my thinking this way for the sake of your gospel. You see, the message never changes, but how it's delivered will. How are we going to do this well together? I think this is what Jesus was trying to teach his disciples, and I honestly think it's one of the reasons that um, he gave us the gift that is communion, 